us with the Rhode Island Center for Freedom and Prosperity back in the studio. Just want to thank again the Borks who had come in as part of the Ripple campaign that everybody has seen from the DOT so far. Very important. We're going to continue to bring this up for, uh, further Thursdays moving forward. But wanted to get Mike in here because the Center just released a report, the right to earn. The right to earn. <laughs> you know, we, we kind of think Rhode Islanders should have the right to work in the profession of their choice without having to get permission from the government, without having to jump through hurdles, without having to pay big fees without having to go through unnecessary and frivolous training. You know, we've got a poor business climate in this state and uh, regulatory reform is free. There's no tax loss of revenues we have to deal with. We just have to get uh, away from our protectionist ways to protect the insiders who often lobby for regulations uh, because they want, they, then they often say we're trying to protect consumers safe for safety issues, but they're really trying to protect themselves from competition, and, and that, that attitude's got to change in this state. Does the state, you know, you talk about there not being a tax burden, but this report identifies, what, just over a hundred occupations that are regulated that you're looking at being able to sort of free up, if you will? Well, we did our report based on a uh, license to work report by the Institute for Justice, which is a national firm. Uh, big national think tank, and they looked at 102 licensed occupations in every single state. And of course, Rhode Island ended up in the bottom 10 as being one of the most burdensome and most licensed state uh, in, in the whole country. I think out of the 102 they looked at, Rhode Island had uh, license mandates in 72 of them. And, uh, and, we're, and we're like the only state in a couple of categories where, where we even demand a license. Uh, one in particular, you know, a non, think of this, a non-teaching teacher's assistant needs a license and has to go through all kinds of, and we're on one, of, one of only five states that requires that. So anyway, just, just the, there's plenty of other examples we can give you, but, but it's all based on that national study. And we looked at some of the more stupid licenses in this state. So, so some of the ideas we'll get into later on how to fix it are both specific on some, some of these licenses and then broader process type fixes as well. You talk about the folks who have the interest in, per, in uh, protecting this uh, licensed industrial complex. <laughs> Is one of the rationales, does this state really get that much revenue from licensing? Um, usually not as much as it thinks. Mm. Uh, most li like the private parties get money from licensing. Well, the, the, the private industries that lobby for licensing benefit because they block out their competition. Mm. Right, so that's the real motivation to most of this. Uh, the fact that the, the licensing fees are often to offset the enforcement fees. Yep. Because right, you got you know if there's a regulation, <laughs> you got to police it, yeah. and then you got to enforce it, and that takes money. So we got to collect a fee to enforce it. That's kind of a wash often, but one of the ones we pointed out in our report, you may remember a few years ago, the um, the tax. You know, if somebody was going away for a week and they wanted to rent their house out, now they want to start taxing that. You know, for, for okay, yeah, I'll pay a thousand bucks for a week now. Well, and they predicted they were going to get seven million dollars from that. They only got like one first year. So these things often, and the reason they get less is because it discourages that activity. Why, why in our state, we're with such a poor business climate, people not earning enough money and good enough jobs, why would we want to discourage any economic activity in this state? And that's really uh, where we are in this. I, I would say, if I could, um, that this is something I have met with the Speaker of the House on, in general, before, long before a report came out. Something he agreed that uh, the General Assembly, uh, that he thought he would work with us on, at least, at least speaking for the House, and that he mentioned in his opening remarks. In, in the opening remarks of the General Assembly of the issue, he spent a good minute talking about the need for regulatory reform. And we've seen some indications from both in the governor's office as well. Yes, actually, the, uh, we give praise, which we don't do very often, to the executive branch uh, under Governor Chafee and now picked up by Governor Raimondo, uh, the Office of Regulatory Reform has been created and has been tasked with looking at this whole issue. They're coming out with a major report next year, a whole year from now. But in the meantime, they've put in place some processes that we'd like to see um, duplicated on the legislative side. For instance, before any new regulation, because don't forget, regulations can be created one of two ways. By agencies at the executive branch level, like the Department of Health, 
or legislatively in the General Assembly through the legislative branch. They only have jurisdiction over executive branch agency rules. But they put in a process now where before any regulation sees the light of day, which we call a sunrise provision, it has to provide documented evidence of the problem, that it's systematic, that it's real, and that something that could be done you know, would improve people's lives somehow. There has to be a cost-benefit analysis to it. What's going to be the cost of this? How much is it going to cost to enforce, mm -hmm. to administer? How much are the fees going to be? How much is it going to hurt our economy? And then, only then, if it satisfies, can it move forward into a common era. We'd like to see that on the um, legislative side. I mean, there's a number of bills out there that they're probably going to get introduced this year that we'd love to see go through the process. They won't because we don't have that law right now. But there's, there's you know, the, the minimum wage is one, right? The last year that paid time off. Nobody did a... Nobody did a cost-benefit analysis. Nobody documented a statement of need to show that everyone just talked about, well, this might happen, so therefore we have to stop it from ever happening. So these are statements of need for more than just regulatory reform. We're talking about any fiscal impact piece of legislation you want to see the fiscal note. Well, we would. That's not part of it. This. this would you just be <laughs> what we're talking about side. today is just on new new regulations. Yeah, we would like to see that any tax and spend bill is, is a good solid fiscal note. I mean, they talk about the need for a fiscal note, but it seems like all somebody has to say is, well, it's going to create jobs. And, oh, okay. Then, We'll do it, you know, without without looking at it. So listen, if we're going to improve our <laughs> dismal, again, we're bottom five in business climate. If we're going to improve that, regulatory reform is the least partisan approach. You know, cutting taxes tends to get divided along party lines. But regulatory reform is something that's free. It doesn't cost money. It's not really that partisan. The only people who are for it are each of the special interest groups that have lobbied for each of those hundreds of pieces of regulation that are in our tax code. In fact, they told me at ORR when I met with them, 27,000 pages of regulations in the state. Now, you, you have all those memorized? <laughs> That's a lot of pages of legislation. So do you envision going through, uh, when this, uh, you're approaching this legislatively, are you going to call out these special interests for who they are and why they are protecting it? Well, we'll call out some of the industries. For for instance, you know the one the one that we've talked about often, and you know again, it's the best example <laughs> is, is the hair braider, right? So just to <clears throat> twist hair, these Cape Verde, it's a Cape Verdean kind of art form, no tools, no chemical, you just twist hair into nice looking braids and <laughs> designs. Uh, you got to go through hundreds of dollars of fees and. and over a thousand hours of cosmetology training, even though you're not doing anything in cosmetology. But yet, barbershops and other hair salons don't want that kind of competition in the industry, and they have successfully blocked that bill. So these are just some of the, but so, so a woman, you know, who, who we know named Jocelyn Decudo, she's from, her family's from Cape Verde, and she can't legally practice this. You know, she can't take money legally for this. So she, I don't know what, how she must do it just for fun for her friends and family, but that's great. But she could go. She'd love to set up her own shop someday, but she can't, she can't afford to go through all that time and money to set up. So we are discouraging people from working just so we can protect the interests of others. We're, we're in a free, we live in a free market, folks. Don't forget that. <laughs> so let's talk. You mentioned addressing it at a legislative from a legislative standpoint, looking at uh, if any new regulations are yep. uh, put forth, looking at that impact. How about the process of can you, the process of rolling back regulations? Yeah, so a couple things. So the, the, um, one of the things we'll push for, so we're going to push for a sunrise provision in the House. We're going to push for a sunset provision, that any regulation that's been on the book for a long time, unless somebody re gives us that statement of need, gives us that, it would become unenforceable. So everyone has like to have a statement of need, as you're saying, if this legislation that you're promoting. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that we're going to even get, get the bill in, but that's the kind of stuff we'd like to see. Again, you got to find someone who's going to do it. So, so that's sunrise, sunset. You know, so, so again, what's the standard for getting something in? We've got to raise that bar. What's the standard for getting bad regulations out? We also would like to have a petition process. Okay. If a business thinks his industry or her industry is unfairly burdened, or as a consumer, because don't forget that also drives up prices for consumers when there's limited competition, prices go up. Mm -hmm. uh, there should be some process by which legislatively or executive people can come in and say, listen, we should review this 
regulation to see if it's really worth it or not. So not even waiting from a, a legislator standpoint, a real grassroots effort, if you will, to address these issues. Yeah, the people are often the, the best judges of, of, of what's out there, the workers, the little small, small business owners. So we need to give them an avenue because right now they feel powerless when these things happen up at, up at the state house. But we need to give them an avenue to petition their government on, on that kind of stuff. So your conversations with the speaker, what do you what do you think that he's amenable to? I mean, he's made this a priority. He's put it out there, as you mentioned, bipartisan across the aisle support for it. What do you think is feasible in this session to be achieved? We're just starting to have some discussions about which of our specific, you know, this report just came out a few days ago. So which which specific uh, recommendations in our report uh, might get some legislative support? So we don't know that yet, and I won't be talking directly with the speaker. Uh, there are some people uh, that I've been I've been asked to speak with, um, but but it cuts both ways. It, it's it's also you can't say you're for regulatory reform and try to roll back a few, but then let a whole bunch more in the front door. <laughs> so minimum wage is one. We're, we're going to hear about this gender pay equity part of the Progressive's Fair Shot Act. Gender, listen, nobody's against the concept of equal pay for equal work, but it's unenforceable. You can't, it's going to create lawsuits. It's going to create uncertainty. Um, you talk about predictive scheduling is something we're expected to be back this year, where employers, once they put out a schedule mm -hmm. two weeks in advance for an employee, if they ch change that schedule for any, any reason, now they've got to pay fines or pay overtime and all, all this. Again, these are, you can't let more regulations in the door if you're saying you want to lessen the burden. So that's something that, that we caution lawmakers mm. also on. Now this net neutrality, right? That's a big issue. Mm. We'll probably do a little mini report on that in, in the coming weeks. We did reference the center's position when they put off the legislation, yeah. put forth the legislation here because they want to make sure that any entity that is involved with an internet-based system is adhering to the principles of net neutrality and the center has something to say about that. Yeah, well net neutrality is a regulation on businesses. It says that any any uh, internet service provider uh, must provide the same product to everybody. You can't make, you can't customize a product for this group of people and you can't customize a product for that group of business owners or whatever. Everything has to be equal. Well, that that's not good for competition. Competition, one of the things you need is product differentiation, right? Different companies should be able to offer different products to different niches. That's what good niche marketing, right? But net neutrality would, would uh, discourage that. So so while Obama put in net neutrality three years ago, Trump took it out last year, now the state of Rhode Island wants to put it back in in our state. And we're saying, again, why would you do that? Again, show us the, remember the process, show us the documented abuse, show us the systematic abuse, show us the people or the businesses that have been harmed before President Obama put it in three years ago, then, then we can have a conversation. But just because you're afraid something might happen, that's called a crystal ball approach, try to look into the future to see what might happen, that's not a good enough reason to put a uh, damper on a whole industry. And you've seen, of course, the arguments that the net neutrality proponents put out that says, you know, creates an unfair playing field and will kind of freeze some people out, low income out. What's your response to that? Well, again, that's their fear. But, but it, it never happened and or barely ever happened. And there's other federal laws that govern. You know, without net neutrality, the Federal Trade Commission governor, the Clayton Act, the Sherman Antitrust Act, all these laws are already in place to protect consumers and to, and to make sure and be a watchdog over businesses. So we don't need this extra restrictive where you've got to funnel everything into this equal, equal, equal. Equal is not how you grow. Equal <laughs> sounds nice, but it's not how you grow an economy. Do you expect if Rhode Island were to, to be successful at the proponents of this, would we get into a, a bit of a, a legal industrial complex? Because you have the FCC involved. If these big businesses said, hey, we've got it on the federal level, could we just see this get lawyered up and in the courts for some time? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, but, but, but also that cuts both ways, right? When, when there's like, like take, take the gender pay equity thing. Okay, again, nobody doesn't agree with that in principle. I don't believe that Rhode Island employers practice unequal pay practices, but just think of the lawsuits that would be created by somebody who feels like they should be earning more than they are, whether you're a male or a female. You know, just think of the lawsuits. Is that good for businesses? Is that good for business climate? Is that good for anybody? So whether it's 
suing for more regulations or suing because there are more regulations, uh, either way it creates a legal mess and, and we just don't want to see employers uh, burdened with, uh, with more threats of lawsuits, which is what overregulation can do. Now, did you release the uh, right to earn in the capital R-I, of course, because it's Rhode Island, hashtag right to earn? Yeah, if you're on Twitter, uh, capital uh, hashtag right to earn, and you're right, R-I, or on our website, rifreedom.org slash right to earn. In fact, that's a fun page. We've got some videos uh, from across the country, even John Stossel's on there about over occupational licensing. I might also say, I, mm. if, I, if I can, there's a quote here from... Again, to show you this is not partisan, from Representative David Cicilline, not usually someone who agrees with, with our line of thing. But he says, when he talks about over-licensing, he says, this, this is nothing short of weaponization of safety requirements against the economic security of working American families. So when somebody goes out, oh, it's for the good of the people, therefore I want you to lock out all my competition, He's, he's, he, he agrees with us. That's weaponizing regulations to protect the insider few. Did you know what context he said that in? I do not, uh, but, we'll I have to, but I have that quote. <laughs> That's that quote. Plug, we'll it in, Google plug it into Google. You can see what it is because, again, he clearly is, is making that point about yes. the overregulation. So we see it from the administration. We see, some, uh, we see the speaker speaking to this as well. And as you mentioned, there's proposals that could be put forth, and we're just looking to see what can be achieved this session. Yeah, and what, yes, we are. We'll, maybe we'll report back once we get an idea of what legislation is going to go, be going in. But I would put out an appeal to the public. Um, if you're in an industry you think is overregulated, where you got to jump through unnecessarily through hoops, or you, where you shouldn't have to jump through hoops. For instance, did you know that you have to get a license to do sign language? I don't know how to do sign language. If, Actually, I do A, B, C, D. I do know a little bit, um, but did you get your license? No, but what what public harm would happen if somebody doesn't do sign language properly? Shouldn't shouldn't you leave that up to the employer or the you know, broadcast station to determine whether some what public harm is there in that? I mean, that's a perfect example of where there's no public harm at all involved. Yet you got to go through these crazy. I would assume just, that the, the deaf and hard of hearing community would know if someone's an effective signer or not. And yeah, but, be, but, that, but they can then complain they can to, say yes. to the broadcaster mm -hmm. or to the company or say whoever. this person and, yeah, is and sufficient let, or this person is not and sufficient. You, and you let the free market <laughs> work it out, right? You know, if they've got a bad sign language person, and by no means should that person keep working, but it doesn't mean the state should get involved in that. Let the free market work that out. So you talk about, obviously, you partner with uh, national orgs a lot, looking at other states and pointing to Rhode Island being in this bottom 10 for regulations. How have we seen states pull themselves out of this overregulated environment? Has it, has it been done? Yeah, it has been, um, and it's, it happens slowly, and, and this will be a multi-year effort for us. It's not going to happen this year, and it's going to take multiple years. But let me, let me even take it one level tangentially. If, if, do I have another minute here? So civil asset forfeiture, have mm. you heard of that one? Mm -hmm. So if you've, again, 27,000 pages of regulations, you're a business owner, you might violate one of those without having any idea you did, right? Right now, the government, if there's suspicion that you may have violated a regulation or committed a crime, they can seize your property. They can seize your cash, your computer, your car, maybe even your house, your, your inventory, and then it's almost impossible to get it back, even if, you're, even if you're clear, even if you're not guilty. Rhode Island was rated a D minus in that. So put the two together, we have really, really high amounts of regulation we get a D minus on civil asset forfeiture laws. So that means that a lot of innocent people who don't even know they're doing something wrong are probably losing their property to the government, who then converts it into cash into their own, you know, their budgets. It's a, it's a big part of a lot of <laughs> a lot of budgets, both locally and at the state level. So these are, this is one of the reforms we'll be pushing for. Do you think there's enough public interest in this in the civil asset forfeiture? Well, it, there is. A there is. I've, I've actually talked, uh, as you know, my friend Ray Rickman, who is part of the Rhode Island Families Coalition. He represents, you know, the African American uh, inner city community, and he's he's aware that this is a problem in their community. Mm -hmm. Now, whether we can generate enough, but so so again, we think this is another bipartisan issue where left and right can agree that that this is unfair, no matter what your you know, your, your persuasion is. You know that private property should not be seized from private citizens unless they're really done something wrong, right? They've broken the law. But right now, you or I could lose our property just under suspicion and never be able to get it back. 
And talk a little bit, you released this report this week. Today they're uh, unveiling the Fair Shot agenda. Did you mean to have this coincide with... with no, we, no, no. We, we've been working on this report a long time, but, it, but it's perfect because their Fair Shot agenda is nothing more than more regulation, regulatory demands that the government put on the business community. And, and our criticism of the Fair Shot agenda is not just the result, and not just the mandates and, and the heavy burden of that and how that will weigh down the industry, but they haven't even attempted to document the need for any of this. It's just, it sounds good, we're afraid it might, again, it's that crystal ball approach, we're afraid this might happen, we're afraid that women might not get paid equally as men, we're afraid that families aren't gonna earn enough money, we're afraid that people lives might be messed up if we have to change our schedule a little bit, so therefore let's do, and, and nobody has documented the, any systematic problems that would lead to such heavy-handed government approach. This is government by political correctness. It's wrong. It's harmful. And unfortunately, our state has been going way too far down that road. So we've had you in before talking about the 18th session. We actually just had Common Cause in this week talking about their legislative agenda. But this is the focus this week is this Right to Earn campaign. What's next in the session? I think it's pr probably going to be it. I mean, we'll be fighting off uh, bad bills, you know, the progressive bills, you know, that, that, that we'll seek to further uh, hamper. When are you going to start identifying these, these bills of the week? Well, we have. If you go to our website, rifreedom.org slash bills, um, we, we not only list in a table all the bills we have identified, but starting last week, uh, and, and this week will be our second, this weekend, we'll, uh, we start doing exposés on some of the, including a nice little three-minute video by me. So go to rafreedom.org slash bills, and you can see all the bills we think are not good for our state. So talk about the first one you unveiled, the first uh, video exposé. Well, the first one was on the single-payer health care, which is a $5.4 billion monstrosity. The second one's more interesting. The one that's coming out this weekend or Monday. Are you going to give us a teaser or do you have to wait? No, I'll give it to you. No, I'll give it to you. <laughs> it's a bill, again, put in by the progressives. And again, it's one of those bills who can argue with it. But when you really think about it, it, it doesn't make sense. The bill, uh, I, I don't have the bill number in front of me. It basically says, it's very short, no student in public or private school shall be discriminated against on the basis of, you know, sex, sexual identity, gender, religion. Yep. You know, okay. Who would disagree with that again, right? Emotionally, it make, but how do you enforce that? What, it doesn't make any attempt to contemplate what discrimination is, how that's defined. Is, is um, not getting selected in the first round of the kickball team at recess, is that discrimination? Is, is the teacher not calling on you as the first one, is that discrimination? It, it doesn't make any attempt to define what it is or what happens to, to to the would-be. Are we going to now criminalize second grader on second grader play if they happen to call somebody a name or, or don't use the right pronoun? Or, so you know, you're so, concerned about the, how, how this would even be enforced? Yeah, this is, you can't legislate morality. You can't legislate people's thoughts or, or intentions. And that's what, so, so while again, th this, is, this is just common sense stuff that doesn't need to be anywhere near a piece of legislation. It's, it's all they're really trying to do here is to reinforce their values to get them more mainstream accepted, but legislation is not the way to do that. They have voices in the media, they have their school committee meetings or their parent PTA meetings, there's other ways, but this, this is not a place for legislation. Again, how do you interpret it? How would you enforce something like that? Just think about how would you enforce that? Whose standard of discrimination are we gonna use? And then, and then of course, they appoint themselves as the judge, jury, and the executioner. Well. I should be that, not them. Well, we do have non-discrimination <laughs> laws on the books. Yes, and that's the point too. We have civil rights laws, and all these things already exist, just like just like they exist with net neutrality. We don't need any more laws that only create uncertainty, only create division, and maybe create unnecessary legal action, uh, especially in our schools. We don't need any more of that. Are you going to be putting a video on this moving forward? Uh, the, yeah, the, I've already made the video. It'll be released over the weekend. So rifreedom.org/bills. And uh, do you select it at the center? Do you encourage people to get in touch with you with ones that they've identified? How's the selection process go? We pretty much do that ourselves. But but I do encourage you, like I said earlier, if, if you're a um, info at rifreedom.org, if, you, if you're in a licensed industry that you think is too severe, or, or there's other regulations on your industry, let us know. And if you'd like to tell your story, we, we're, we call you guys heroes. We'd love to find heroes out there who are willing to tell their story about 
how, how big government is, is hurting their chance or their right to earn a living. We've heard from the hair breeders. Have you any other industries sort of bubbling up right away here? Well, there's a new bill uh, going in, for instance, uh, to now license dog groomers. Now, so this is another reason you get licensed. We call it do-gooder. There was a case where a dog died under the care of a dog groomer. Now, I don't know what happened, but now all of a sudden we got a licensed dog groomers. So, so it's these people who knee-jerk reactions to stories, you know, in the media or in the public. So, oh, I gotta, I'm a lawmaker. I gotta do something. I gotta feel good about myself. I gotta tell my lawmakers I did something to right this terrible wrong. We don't know if that was an isolation. So again, this is where process would help. Are dog deaths or dog injuries a systematic problem in our state, or was this just one isolated? I don't know the answer to that. Wouldn't it be nice to know before we slap the license on the whole industry? So again, that's just another example of how the proper process has to be in place before we put in regulatory reform. If there's a systematic problem, if there's abuse, if there's, you know, to humans or to animals, then yeah, then we've got to do something about it. But but show me there's a problem first. So as your free market guy, I don't want to tack too far here, but free mar the market's this week a little volatile. What's your thoughts on what's uh, been happening in the financial uh, I, I was waiting for this. I mean, I, mean, I mean, it was just going, you know, it was going up too fast, A. Uh, there's no way you could sustain that. So this is what they just call a natural correction. Mm. Now, if it keeps going down, I'll be worried, but I think we've hit that 10% correction mark. Okay. But the other thing I just heard on the way in here, too, um, is that a lot of the market uh, dive, and the market doesn't define the economy. Remember, okay. often the markets will go down while the economy is going up. And in this case, apparently, one of the factors is that the economy is going too good because when int because that means interest rates, that means inflation. The market hates inflation and high interest rates. So with the jobs report, the, I think the lowest uh, job jobless claims or something just today, and, and and all the other increasing. So sometimes it's weird how the market goes mm. down when good economic go, goes up. So I'm not worried about it. Obviously, if you got a 401k, you know, you know, just just leave it in there. It's going to recover. It's going to recover. That would be my advice. Uh, but this this was expected to me. But but the good news is it was largely not exclusively, but largely because of good economic news. Well, why don't you? And again, this report is on the Center for Freedom and Prosperity's website. The right to earn. Hashtag if you're on Twitter and you're tweeting about this, but as Mike said, if you want to get in touch with the center, if you're in the business world and have concerns about regulations, uh, that's one of the pieces, again, that petition piece um, that is going to be yeah, we're gonna Yeah, we want to push for that. We want to see a process whereby lawmakers and agencies uh, can hear from people who, who think they're being un unfairly burdened. Okay, very good. Well, we'll have Mike Stenhouse back here, I'm sure, soon. You've been here in the studio before. And that just about wraps up another day here at the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. We'll be back tomorrow with Molly O'Brien at 3 o'clock. I'll be back at 4 to start off the weekend. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.